I want to thank you for joining us for our Tuesday Bible study. Let us begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the blessings of this day and pray that you be with us in our study tonight. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are in the book of James. We're moving all the way swiftly through it to the book of James chapter 2. Just to remind you, in case you missed last week about the book of James, James is a very late addition to our Bible. Um, and uh, it, it, came, it was not well attested to in the early church. It means the early church did not pass the book of James on as frequently as it did Paul's books. James seems to know, or at least be well aware of Paul's books, and is responding to Paul's theology. Whether he vehemently disagrees with Paul, or at least how Paul is being used, one of those two, it's evidently clear, he wants to clear a few things up. Because remember, Paul's perspective is, it is by, what again? Grace that you're saved through faith, not works. Well, again, James is all about works. It's about, James is like, are you kidding me? You might be saved through grace, but there dang well better be works involved with this. Now, I know, we kind of harmonize that and say, well, come on, they weren't disagreeing. Oh, no, theologically we're disagreeing, and we know this because of the discussions that the early church fathers had about this. When they were entering this book into the canon of Scripture, they vehemently disagreed about whether this book should or should not be entered in because they understood it as a direct confrontation to Paul's theology. So those were the early Christians. Those are the Christians, our church fathers, who put this book in the Bible understood there was a conflict here. And it was not all roses and peaches and cream, because many people thought it should not be in. Martin Luther, if you remember last week we said, called the Gospel of James, or the Gospel of James, there is actually a Gospel of James, but um, the book of James, he called it a Gospel, do you remember what it was? Gospel of straw. And uh, that's because straw has no nourishment value to it whatsoever for animals. Animals don't eat straw, they eat hay. Okay? So, um, he said there's no gospel in this. There's nothing about who Jesus is. You can't read the book of James and learn about God's salvation and love, and love for you. You have to turn somewhere else. Well, like I said, James is within the context of a larger canon, and so I think we're okay. In the same way that we're okay, we have a book like Song of Solomon. Well, there's no gospel in the Song of Solomon, is there? <laughs> or uh, how about the book of Judges? The project, book of Judges, a pretty dang depressing book. But it's an important book. It, it is ultimately surrounded by God's will for us, when, when we see in other places. But the people of Israel were just being outright lunatics and a little bit crazy in the book of Judges. Nevertheless, let's go on. We can handle a book that doesn't directly address who Jesus is and what he did for us. So yes, it's a gospel of straw, but I think there are some important things for us here in it. So let's take a look at James 2. Sorry, Martin. Um, all right, my brothers and sisters, James writes, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. So this is the start of our theme for today. Uh, let's put that one in red. No, what did he say? Favoritism. No favoritism. Of anybody. No, I will tell you, honestly, I don't, I don't think that happens. I think that favoritism happens in our churches all the time. We have people that we like more. There are people who are rich and they give a lot of money, they get a lot of attention, and certainly sometimes pastors spend an inordinate amount of energy running after the people who are going to uh, line the coffers of the church. I will be frank with you, the poor people in the church give a whole lot more than the rich people. I think that's kind of usually true. So, uh, but that shouldn't be why we are chasing after people anyway. Nevertheless, this is what was happening in that day. There was a favoritism shown to those who were richy rich, okay? And so they had 
money in their eyes. Let's chase after these people and show them favoritism. Always happening in our world, in our country, in our churches. It goes on, for if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and is dressed in bright clothes, but a poor man in dirty clothes also comes in, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the bright clothes and say, you, sit here in a good place. But you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. So again, the rich man gets a place of honor, the poor man gets a place of dishonor. As though he has nothing worthy of saying. Verse 4, have you not made a distinction among yourselves and have become judges with evil motives? Now, let me, let me stop with this word because we actually in our Bible lesson for Sunday, um, not this Sunday, but the Sunday before, we dealt with the word judge, judging other people. You know, there's actually nothing wrong with judging. In fact, I, had a, I told a story on Sunday about uh, a shirt, t-shirt I saw a woman wearing one time and said, I'm judging you. Well, <laughs> we, you know, people say, don't judge people. And your Bible says not judging. You're not supposed to judge people. No, hold on. Remember, this is an English translation of a Greek word spoken by Jewish people. So this has come through multiple translations to get to us. So don't use our English words and say, oh, you're not allowed to judge. I judge people all the time. You know, we judge people who want to take care of our kids. Is that person worthy of taking care? Am I going to allow my daughter or my, you know, my dog to be in the care of this person? We make judgments about that, people like that. That's nothing bad. Uh, the Bible, what the Bible says about not judging has to do with salvation or status. I have no right to assign person to heaven or hell, like I know who should be or should not be going to heaven or hell. Churches do that. They judge people, their destination, and where they're heading. That's not our job. That's in the domain of God. So in essence, what he is saying is the people are judging these person, their status and their relationship with God based upon how wealthy they are. That's a judgment that we should not be making. That's wrong, okay? So, he goes on, listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, did, verse 5, did God not choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? Okay, I encourage you to read the Bible, stopping right here, and I want you to name for me, let's see if we can think of it. I want you to name for me all the rich people that God chose. Okay, well, Abraham was kind of rich. Um, let me see, who else? David, later, he was a poor shepherd, though, first. So I was going to say David, but let's take David off the list because he was poor. He started as a poor boy, from a poor family. I know, I already did that Scaramouche joke. Sorry. So David was a poor boy, for, from a poor family. Uh, Abraham, actually Abraham was dang wealthy from the get-go. But So he's kind of an exception to the rule. Let me see, who else was rich? Um, you'd be hard-pressed to find many other people. Almost every single person that God chose was a poor guy or a poor woman. Um, I don't know, let me think. Let me think of some good examples of poor people. I don't know, uh, that Mary and Joseph character. They were pretty poor. I don't know, their only job was raising the Savior of the world, right? This is typically how God does it. God chooses the smallest of nations, the most insignificant of the insignificant of people, the poorest of the poor to prove that it is God that's doing this incredible thing. So if you look at the wealth of somebody and they're sitting there wearing their Armani suit, I'll be frank with you, I wouldn't go into a church with a pastor with an Armani suit on. I'd rather have a more humble servant of God preaching the gospel to me. Listen, 
Let me read that again, my beloved brothers and sisters. Did, did, not God, did God not choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. It is not the rich who oppress you. Is it not the rich? Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Boy, ain't that the truth. You know, I, I will tell you what, we have a friend in Kentucky who was struck her, in her car. She was in her car, uh, struck by a truck. And um, she's elderly. She's in her mid-80s right now. And uh, basically, the store had cameras that saw her being struck by this truck. However, the store doesn't want to get involved, so they're not releasing those cameras to demonstrate that it was this truck that hit her, because they don't want to be involved with that. And this trucking company of this guy who is delivering food to the store, they aren't going to say anything, and they're saying, well, she's just an old woman. So here's what the insurance companies do, is they are waiting for her to die, basically her lawyer. This woman's lawyer said to her, they're just, her, her lawyer said to her, they're just waiting for you to die because they know they'll keep dragging this on and dragging this on. You have to go contest this and contest that in hopes that you will die. And then if they have any bills, they're going to come and sue your kids for everything that they lost. It's the rich getting richer at the expense of the poor. That's kind of a sick system that we live in, isn't it? This has always happened. Everybody says, oh, look at the United States. We're no different than any other country. This happens all over the world. It has been happening for all time. The rich drag the poor to court and get rich off of the backs of the poor. So why are you caring about the rich? This is why God always chooses the poor. This is what he's saying. You've dishonored the poor men. Do they not... Rich man, do they not blaspheme the good name by which you have been called? Rich people, that is. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin, and you are convicted by the law as violators. For whoever keeps the whole law, yet stumbles in one point, has become guilty of all. So if you're showing favoritism to rich, and otherwise you're a good person. At least you think you are. Um, you're disobeying God's will. You're outside of God's will because you're dishonoring the poor, the people of God. It's kind of like Tevye and Fiddler on the Roof. God, you must love poor people. You made so many of them. God does love the poor. And James keeps reiterating this over and over and over again, how we are to have hearts for those who, who are disadvantaged. That's why our hearts ought to pour out to them, because these are the people of God. All right, let's go on. So if you show partiality, you are committing a sin, and you're convicted under the law as a violator. Whoever keeps the entirety of the law, it stumbles into one point, has become guilty of all. Then verse 14. So what use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Again, Paul, ding bat. Do you see how he's confronting Paul? Paul, you got to have works. Don't tell us salvation has nothing to do with works. You can tell he's clearly read Paul's works. Can that faith save him? Paul's like, of course faith can save him. Not according to James. James, you better be doing something, and you better not be showing partiality. Going on. If a brother or sister is without clothing and his need of daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? In the same way, faith also, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Okay. Again, Paul, by grace you are saved through faith, not of works. James says, are you kidding me? You need works. Because faith ain't going to save you. James is very concerned, as I mentioned to you, about the poor. Paul is also, by the way. He's very concerned that our faith pour out in blessing the poor. In fact, he mentions it often, but Paul doesn't hammer people with it. He just says, I'm encouraging you to give to the poor. It's because you've been loved by God. 
So for Paul, it's a different motivation. Now, I will tell you honestly, I think what it is is it's two different contexts. Faith is like a pendulum. There are some people who talk about what you got to do all the time, like James. You must care for the poor, and you must do this. And then there's somebody who says, but I don't hear the grace of God in this. So the pendulum, which is over here, now swings over to here. It is by grace that you're saved, not of works. Oh, that's so refreshing. Wait a minute. That means I don't have to do anything? No, nope. the pendulum swings back here. This is historically what happens century after century after century. So we have Paul on one side. We have James on the other side. The truth is kind of somewhere, isn't it somewhere in the middle? Okay, somewhere in the middle. It is true, you're not saved by your good works. However, our faith should result in the caring for the poor. There's the balance. Paul's an extremist, and so is James. But right in there, smack dab in the middle, I think, is right where we need to be. Okay, let's finish our lesson. So if one of you says, go in peace, be warm, be filled, yet you do not have given what's necessary for your body, what use is that? In the same way, faith also, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. All right. So let's kind of be in the very in the middle. Let's take Paul and say, man, he had some great theology there. Let's take James and say, James is a good corrective to that to make sure we're right there in the middle as much as we can. Of course, it's impossible because we're going to swing back and forth in our lives one way or the other. And that's okay. It is the reason why somebody goes to a Lutheran church and all of their life and said, oh, I just hate the Lutheran church. I don't hear about God. Then they go to Assemblies of God Church and say, I found life in the Assemblies of God Church. You know what? Good for you. But then they come back and slam the Lutheran Church. And you guys, you just don't preach the gospel and you're awful. Well, guess what? I can tell you for a fact that we have quite a number of people from the Assemblies of God Church who come to our church and say, I'm just dead inside from being in the Assemblies of God. But I found such life here in the Lutheran Church. Who's right and who's wrong? Neither one. Thank God for the assemblies of God. We're able to take the people from the Lutheran church who have not heard the good news of God because they're just immune to it. They can't hear it here. And they're there for them. And that person's life is transformed. Thank God for them. Not my church. I couldn't go to the assemblies of God. But I'm grateful they exist because they are blessing a lot of people from our denomination, from Catholics, Episcopalians, who have not heard of the grace of God in our denomination. But thank God for the Lutherans, because we are blessing people who didn't hear it in the assemblies of God, who felt nothing but grief and angst and pain. We are both necessary, and I would say James is necessary, and so is Paul. They create a balance. It is by grace you are saved through faith, not of works, as anyone should boast. Paul, you got to have works because we need to feed the poor. You got them both. You got grace through faith, and now you've got the opportunity to be a blessing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for James, and we thank you for his balance to Paul. You know, Paul can be a little bit exhausting. Uh, James can be a little bit exhausting, too, if all we do is we live in James. We need to live there somewhere in the middle. And so we pray that you would help us, God, to live our lives there. I, I know it's impossible. We're going to swing back and forth and all over the place in between. But help us, at least, to be faithful witnesses, to understand that the gift of salvation comes from you, but that in turn, we need to take this gift of salvation and be a blessing to others. For he asks this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, may the Lord bless you and keep you and send you forth in peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Go in peace, sir the Lord. Thanks be to God.